mean, this is a protector area of work that I have a, a, a protector interest and, and, and passion about, and I'm doing some work locally around, um, I suppose, drilling down and understanding as a society what substance misuse is, um, because it tends to be something that it is very emotive, um, it's very challenging. The, the nature of substance misuse and, and even self-harm has changed so dramatically from even when I was growing up, where it was strictly, you know, it was either alcohol or drugs, and now we deal with poly substance. And I know as a city, and I, I'm making these observations, that there has been much, much debate in, in my own city around this need for detoxification, which, you know, in my view, is, is only part, a very specialised part of, of this issue. Um, but we've had the, the ironic situation locally where we've had something like 52,000 people who have signed a petition for this detoxification centre as if, you know, this will solve all of our issues. And, and what's very sad is there's almost a desperation in people to say, you know, here's the centre, I will put my child son or daughter into that and after five or six days it's resolved and no it's not so part of the work that i'm involved in locally is trying to understand really the nature of addiction the change in nature of addiction and the types of interventions that are actually required so i'm pleased from from that purpose is to be able to just say a few words today and i mean obviously there's there's interlinked policy areas of suicide and self-harm and you know we we had a debate just this week in the assembly around mental health and, and sometimes the mental health, the, the link with, with suicide. And they are particularly complex and really, really emotive issues. And quite, I suppose, realistically, they can touch every family um, they, uh, across the board. And that brings its own challenges, obviously, to, to families, to communities, and to services and providers. Uh, there are significant public health issues, um, and from, from my role in terms of the chair of the Committee for Health and Social Services, that remains a key priority for, for us in going forward. And I suppose, in trying to understand all of this, but as a very, very emotive issue, as I've said, there, there's no single reason why someone, I suppose, may want to take their own life or may take their own life. But certain things can increase the risk um, a person can be more likely to have suicidal thoughts if they have a mental health condition, such as depression, bipolar or schizophrenia. Misusing alcohol, as I've touched on, or drugs and having poor job security can make a person vulnerable. And we also need to bear in mind, I suppose, the specific circumstances of every person who becomes suicidal. There, there are specific circumstances that can quite often be unique and are, are certainly unique to that person. A further significant, if you like, public health issue is the issue of self-harm. And this is one, I suppose, that I, in my own head, am trying to, to grapple with, even in its definition. And I think that's part of the learning that will, will come out of some of the conversations today. Because we're told it occurs whenever someone intentionally damages or injures his or her body, usually as a means of coping with or expressing overwhelming emotional distress. And you know, some of the things, unfortunately, as a society that we would be familiar with would be cutting, burning, or pinching. But there are other ways to self-harm, including abusing drugs and alcohol or having an eating disorder. And I suppose when we reflect on, on the statistics, and I, I just want to maybe make reference to this, because again, in the work that I'm doing in the Northwest, you know, when we, we try to um, understand, again, the, the, the reasons, the behaviours, the illness almost um, that, that, that translates in, into suicide. Uh, we looked through the University of Ulster and, and Professor Siobhan O'Neill in particular looked at the suicides. Uh, I think it was something in the region, it was over 1,600 cases that she looked at. And over half of them, over 50% of them, had mental health issues. Whereas a city, the, the kind of, if you like, almost urban view was this was strictly addiction in its strictest sense when it wasn't. Now, there was huge amounts of those cases, I have to say, and there's a real challenge that weren't known to services, and that's, that's a particular gap as well. We've had 268 suicides in the north, and, and you know I don't think there's anybody in this room or any other room would say one's too many. 
And as I state, stated, there's a number of cases that aren't known to health and social care beforehand. Uh, and many of the people who die by suicide have a history of self-harm. We looked at some of the figures around the self-harm registry. And again, stark reality for, for all of us. Over 8,000 self-harm presentations to A&E, and that was 2013-14, um, involving nearly 6,000 people. And there are likely to be many more cases that are not recorded. And I think there is an issue here as well about how we record, collect, and, and report, and share some of this uh, important information as well. Those aged between 15 and 29 years of age, that particular age group accounted for almost half of all the self-harm cases. And drug overdose was found to be the most common method of self-harm, and that's probably contrary to what people think about when they generally loosely think about issues like self-harm. So the policy bit, I suppose, concerning suicide and self-harm is contained within the Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety's refreshed Protect Life strategy. It was published in June um, at a lifespan of two years. And since then, since March 2014, we've been waiting, I have to say disappointedly waiting, for a new updated strategy from the department. And I think, and I just want to maybe make reference to this as well, because I also chair the all-party group on mental health. And yesterday, and indeed at our last meeting, we had a very powerful conversation around zero suicide. And that is almost like a, a policy direction, but with practical outcomes around how issues like mental health and suicide are you know, cross-sectoral and how we tailor our thinking accordingly. So when we, we look at even in terms of the drugs and alcohol strategy here in the north of Ireland, there's approximately 8 million allocated every year to its implementation and there's additional funding provided through the mental health budget. Evidence certainly tells us, and uh, I listened yesterday to Professor Rory O'Connor um, from Glasgow saying there is just not enough being done. It's not further up, it's not high enough up the political agenda, both in terms of, of mental health and suicide, and particularly uh, among our young men, uh, and the need to be moving this further up the agenda. So I'm very pleased, as I said, I'm, I'm disappointed to have to leave because I do actually feel very passionate about this whole area, but I know that Leslie Ann will share the, the findings from today. Very pleased that we have a number of experts um, to address us here today. We have Dr. Karen Galway on behalf of Queen's, and I know Queen's um, has just completed a piece of research with Action Mental Health around mental health generally, but very stark lessons in that, that our system's fragmented, uh, and that we need to look at things like how we ring fence funding towards some of these issues, complex as they are. And I think Karen will look at the the, the relationship, the very complex relationship between alcohol, drugs and suicide, because it's not always as, as, as clear as maybe people have a view to. And second of all, we've had Dr Denise O'Hagan, also from Queen's, and your presentation will look at the findings from the Registry of Self-Harm, and again, I touched on some of that. We also have Dr Maggie Long from the University of Ulster, looking at particularly self-harm and help-seeking help from the perspectives of service users and practitioners. So I'm very pleased to have had a chance to say a few words. Very, very passionate about how we take this learning and move it further up the agenda. Certainly as chair of the committee, my door is open to doing that and exploring how best we take that forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, hi, my name is Karen Galway. I'm a lecturer in mental health at the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Queen's University Belfast. So I'm presenting an investigation into substance misuse in life and in death at a, in a two-year cohort of suicides. <clears throat> so we know that dependent substance misusers share many of the characteristics with people who die by suicide, such as psychopathology or mental health problems. As may have said, um, social isolation is an important feature and generally lower socioeconomic status. And it's common for 
the issue of impaired reasoning and perception to form part of the narrative of a suicide. But relatively little is known about how substance misuse in life relates to substance misuse at the time of death by suicide. I think that's partly because when researchers study this area, they focus in on people with substance misuse problems. Whereas what we've done in this piece of work is we've, had, we've had taken a broader view of all those who died by suicide over a certain period of time, and we've looked at their uh, substance misuse history, if there is one, and their substance misuse at the time of death, if that is recorded. So just in terms of context for the Northern Ireland setting, you know, recently research has exposed high levels of mental health problems, particularly PTSD, and we know that alcohol use is relatively high. About three quarters of our population regularly drink alcohol and around a third of our population engage in regular binge drinking. In Northern Ireland, we also have uh, inflated use of prescription drugs, in particular anxiolytics. So that's anti-anxiety drugs like diazepam, Valium and antidepressant drugs. So coupled with this, we have these ra rising rates of suicide over the last 15 years, which you know, everyone is finding alarming. So the project that I've been involved in is called Understanding Suicide. And the design of this project has allowed us to examine the role of substance misuse in life and substance misuse at the time of death by suicide. So we've done this by matching the individual data from the coroner's records to the GP medical records for the lifetime of, the, of each individual. And just to run you through this quickly, in phase one then, what we did was we did an audit of two years of confirmed suicides, which was 403 individuals whose, whose death is confirmed a suicide. And then from that, we were able to extract information from the pathology reports on blood alcohol levels and the blood toxicology reports on any non-therapeutic substance misuse. So we looked at the sort of classic illicit drug use, heroin, cocaine, cannabis, but we also looked at any use of prescription drugs, which was over and above the therapeutic accepted therapeutic level. So it's all kinds of substance misuse we included there. Then in phase two of our study, we matched the coroner's records to the GP records. And as you can see, we, we lost a few here because we weren't able to access all of the GP records. Uh, but we still had, had a, good re a good level of information here. And we were able to compare and contrast and see which ones were missing and what, were, they, were they going to make an impact on things. And we've discovered that they, they weren't going, it wasn't going to make an impact that we lost these records. Um, so in the GP records then we were able to classify each individual according to whether they had ever sought help from the GP for any kind of substance misuse problem. So any kind of seeking, help seeking for alcohol problems and any kind of help seeking for drug misuse. Phase three of the study involved qualitative interviews with the relatives of people who died, but that's not something I'm going to discuss today. But that did allow us to have that tri triangulation around the narrative of the death. Okay. So, as I said, our data contains information from all deaths that were confirmed by the coroner as suicide between... Um, February 2007 and February 2009. And this just gives you a description of who those people were. So we were looking at mainly males, as is usually the case in suicide, aged between 11 and 83 years with an average age of around 40. 50% uh, were married or cohabiting, 38% uh, were employed, and then this just shows you the <coughs> urban-rural breakdown of these individuals. 
and to give you a general sense of their engagement with primary care doctors for any reason. We looked just initially at help seeking for, for anything at all and what we found was that 8 out of 10 of these people who died had seen their GP in the past 12 months, which is actually quite normal, you know, that, that's like a population figure for any group. Um, but what we saw was that 71% of those had presented with mental health concerns of some kind or another. Um, around, also around 50% of these people were what we would classify as frequent attenders. So they had been to the GP like more than six times over that 12 month period. Um, and the last th three bullets here just give you some idea of the mental health profile of these individuals. So um, the thing I suppose to note then is that our information was from the, from the primary care doctor. And as we know, in terms of substance misuse, voluntary sector and community sector support is really important. And we may not have captured it, some of that because it may not be in the GP record. So that's just something to note at this stage. Okay. So in our phase one data collection from the pathology reports, these contained results of blood alcohol measure, which was carried out on pretty much everybody who died by suicide. However, what we found was that toxicology testing for drug misuse was actually only carried out on 54% of those, those confirmed deaths by suicide. So first, I'm going to tell you about the alcohol results. So we find that about half of the cohort of deaths tested positive for alcohol. And of these, I guess the important part here is this one. So this is the level of alcohol in the blood that indicates that this person was above the drink driving limit. And that was four out of 10 of those who had a positive result. And more than a quarter were actually double this level. Um, the drink driving limit is just an accepted level of impaired perception which, if you remember I said at the beginning, is an important aspect of this whole issue of the use of drugs and alcohol at, at the time of suicide. And in general, what we can say is that around a third of those had sought help for alcohol problems over their lifetime, and about a quarter had sought help for alcohol problems in the last 12 months before death. Okay, so if we look at a bit more detail at this, just bear with me, I'll talk you through this slide. Um, there's a lot of pies. So what we have in the middle is all those who uh, were tested and matched to GP records. And what we can see is that 42% were over the limit, 58% under the limit, so on the right hand side, out of those who were over the limit at the time of death, then this shows you how many of them had sought help for an alcohol problem in their lifetime. So actually it's about half and half. Half of these people had sought help and half hadn't. But perhaps more interestingly and unexpectedly is the other side of the pie. So these people were under the limit at the time of death and what we see here is actually a quarter of these people had sought help in the past for an alcohol problem. So even though they had an alcohol problem in the past, when they died by suicide, that wasn't a feature. It wasn't part of the narrative. So moving on to the blood toxicology results of both illicit and prescription drug misuse. So I mentioned earlier that only 54% of the cohort were tested. And in this context that we're dealing with those two different types of drug misuse, of illicit drugs and prescription drug misuse. So here what we have is we can see 37% of those who were tested had misused substances at the time of death. 
and around a quarter of these people had sought help for drug misuse uh, across their lifetime, with half of those having sought help in the past 12 months. And before looking at this in a bit more detail, what we were interested to find out was, you know, why were only 54% of people tested when, um, you know, there was the, the case, it was just a case of suicide, as we as researchers expected that everybody would be tested for drug misuse in the case of suicide. Um, so we looked at this both statistically and by talking to the pathologists and the coroners, but the statistics showed us that <coughs> actually when we looked at well, what made a person more likely to be tested, there was no effect uh, by gender. So it didn't matter if you're male or female, that didn't have an effect on whether a person was tested or not. The number of drugs prescribed at the time of death, that didn't seem to have an impact on whether a person was tested or not. Treatment status at death, mental health diagnosis, history of help seeking for alcohol misuse, urban rural setting or prior suicide attempts, none of these things seemed to impact on whether a person was tested or not. What was implicated in the statistics was the method of suicide. That's on, you know, not, not surprising because if there's a drug overdose scenario, then of course there'll be testing done. Um, history of help seeking for drug misuse. So if at the scene, the coroner or the pathologist were able to get information about any history of drug misuse that made it more likely that this test was carried out, as you would expect. And age, so younger people were much more likely to be tested for drug misuse at the time of death. Now, just to drill down into that a wee bit more, um, in terms of method, you know, as expected, if there was an overdose, it was 14 times more likely that you would be tested for toxicology, blood toxicology tests done, um, compared to hangings. Um, history of drug misuse made a person twice as likely to be tested, and age, young people were significantly more likely to be tested for drug misuse. Now, the interesting thing about that is that when you look at the results of the testing, there was actually no difference across age in the detection of drug misuse. So across all the age bands, there were around about a quarter to about 30% of people had a positive result that did not differ across age. So in a sense, what's happening there is there's a, there's a bias in the testing. You know, there's no need to be testing the young people more so than the older people when we can see that the levels are equal across age. So again, I'll talk you through this. In terms of then, uh, despite only half of those being tested, what we see here is a diagram that actually quite similarly mirrors that of alcohol. So again, in the middle, what we have is uh, all those who were tested. We had 37% showing misuse of drugs and 63% showing no misuse of drugs. And again, over here on the right, a slightly different split because we had about 50-50 with alcohol, whereas we have a slightly lesser group seeking help, and that's probably to do with you know, the illicit nature, the illegal, illegality, and the stigma that would, extra stigma that would be involved in seeking help for drug misuse. Um, and again, then over this side, we have the same quite interesting result which shows us that even though there are people here who were not misusing substances at the time of death, it was not a part of the narrative of their suicide, but there are some people here who had a history of drug misuse in their lifetime of seeking help for drug misuse. So to round all this up then, into a discussion and some recommendations, I mean, the, the findings show that the relationship between drug and alcohol misuse at the time of death by suicide and across a person's lifetime, it's not a simple picture, it's quite complex, which, you know, it's just another layer of complexity that we can add to suicide um, because it's a complex topic all around. So 
amongst those with no history of misuse, we find positive results. And that's not really surprising because in, in the sense of a sort of opportunistic uh, at the time of death, you know, people do misuse substances. That's, we, we knew that already. Amongst those with a history of misuse, positive results were found. Again, that's not very surprising. But what, what we were un, what not expecting was to find that amongst those with a history of misuse, negative results were found at the time of death. And what that really suggests is that some of the mechanisms associated with substance misuse as a risk factor for suicide um, are, are, are stay, hanging around even after this period of abstinence from the misuse itself. So that just tells us something about the complexity and I think that probably the interaction between substance misuse and you know, mental health difficulties in general. But what we've highlighted in this piece of work is um, something about the toxicology practices here in Northern Ireland. So we know, we know um, in Northern Ireland across the UK, actually there's no legal requirement for testing for drugs uh, at, at a death by, that is suspected suicide. But we can also see that international guidelines on this differ. In Ireland, pathology guidelines do suggest that testing is carried out for every suicide. But in Northern Ireland, what we have is this pathologist and coroner discretion around this issue. And why do we have that? Because the remit of the coroner and the pathologist is to discover what is the biological cause of death. So we're working within a very medical model here. And uh, what are the implications of that? Well, you know, I think... It, we know substance misuse is important in suicide, so it is really important that we better understand these mediating factors that exist and that are involved in substance misuse, um, including the role of impaired reasoning and perception at the time of a suicidal act. And in hangings, which in the case of our cohort of deaths over two years, comprised 76% of these deaths, within and this exclusively medical approach to cause of death, the associated so social and psychological context surrounding the suicide is diminished. It's not important to the coroner and the pathologist because it's not part of their remit of their job. And that's very unfortunate for us trying to work on prevention. So for prevention, you know, what, what this research suggests, what I'm suggesting, is that we need a change in ethos, we need a change in regulations and the guidelines um, so that we can take into account these wider social and psychological issues that are clearly you know, part of our efforts towards suicide prevention. Thanks.